Well, good morning, ladies. My name's Tammy Holty, and we just sang a song, We Are a Child of God, and that changes everything. Changes everything. So, what I want to talk about today is suffering. And used to be when people would talk about suffering, I would roll my eyes and say, I don't want to hear it. I want to hear it. I've had enough of that, right? I want to hear joy. I want to hear peace. I want to hear something else. I've had enough suffering. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my childhood, just a little bit. Very early on, the devil just got a foothold. I had been sexually abused very early. We're talking five, six, and seven years old. So the devil's plan is to come early, right? And God has another plan though. And during that time, because of that abuse, I, I began very early not to trust people and always looking and just expecting the worst to happen. And I, I have a distinct memory during this time uh, I was being placed in a learning disabilities class at school because I couldn't read and I, I was really struggling. And my, my mom and dad and anything I say about my family today is under the blood, right? So it's under the blood, it's taken care of. But they were very young when they had their kids and there was a lot of neglect and abuse. And it just wasn't a, a type of home that children would thrive in. And so those thought patterns and those bondages started so early. And um, I remember going to the grocery store one time and we were wild. We were wild, and my mom was pretty passive. She would dance, the wildness didn't bother her. We were running down this grocery store <coughs> aisle, and I know we had been playing out in the backyard, and we had been in the mud, and my hair was all ratty looking, and all these nasty, dirty clothes on, and around the end of this one aisle in the grocery store, came skipping this little girl and she had white patent leather shoes with lacy ankle socks and she had a dress on. She had, you know, this was back in the 60s. So she had these little white gloves. I'm sure they, it was on a Sunday probably. She had just got back from church. She had a little, you know, a purse and her hair was braided and she had these beautiful ribbons. And that moment, I stopped and I looked at that little girl. And all of a sudden I thought, she is loved. She is special. That's not me. The devil, those, those things, everybody has memories like that. They're heart-wrenching, they're heartbreaking, and they stay with you for a long time. Now, when I, were, when I was praying about this message, the word the Lord gave me was, my daughters have been, and it wasn't in a calm, sweet voice, it was loud. My daughter's self-worth and self-esteem has been annihilated. So if you're one of those daughters, I want to show you a different side of suffering. And I might have to allude to other things. But, you know, even when I went to visit my grandma, she would only take one of us kids at a time because we were wild. And as soon as I'd go to my grandma, the first thing she'd do 
is run a tub of water. So hot soapy water, make me take a bath, comb my hair, right? Mm -hmm. Put the little ribbons in, put the really nice clothes on, and then I was presentable. Now, I didn't really realize what that all was about. But you know, it is a picture. It is a picture of women without God and a woman with God, right? Filthy rags, robes of righteousness. It is the best, it is the ultimate to be chosen and to be called and to be set apart. It is the ultimate. So, I, I have this, I think that the church might have a little bit of, maybe a, a religious slant on the sufferings of Christ. And what I mean by that is, how many times have we heard about Christ suffering, carrying that cross, being whipped, being battered, being bruised, all for us, right? Being hung on a cross, naked. We're gonna talk sexual abuse. He hung naked. He was man slash the Messiah. When I when he talked to me about my sexual abuse, I said, how, how do you know? And he told me, I hung on a cross, naked, exposed, okay? So, you know, we see Jesus' suffering at the cross, and I'm not taken away from any of that. And we see that he went to hell and he was resurrected, right? So, but then in my mind anyways, he went to heaven and that was the end of his <coughs> suffering. I, I'm gonna show you that's not true. I'm gonna show you. But I think that's a religious slant that we have. That's the only prism that we see it of it. So, um, and you know, I always, for, for a very long time, I've known Jesus, but I really had a problem with the Father. And not that he had done anything or whatever, but because of my earthly father and all those wounds, it was much more difficult to come to the Father. Um, so I had an experience with the Lord, and I'm going to try to go through it briefly. I, um, we had got a phone call by, about a friend. She was a doctor, and her husband was on a ventilator. He had COVID. He had other, he had diabetes and some other things. And so I had been praying for that person, and I'd been praying for a couple other people. And it, it was really heavy. Look at all these people that are suffering. And I had sit down in my chair where I pray, and I said, Lord, all this suffering. And I envision this woman, you know, our sight sometimes hinders our faith. And I could imagine seeing her, and doctors always know more than what a normal person would about what he's going through. And now he's on a ventilator, which we all know that was not a good thing with COVID. Mm -hmm. And she was seeing tubes, you know, he had a breathing machine, all the heart rate, the monitors and the tubes in, down his throat, the IVs, all these things. And I, I just welled up with compassion as I was thinking of these things. Then I was thinking about my other friend that had fallen and they thought he was gonna be paralyzed. And I was thinking, God, how do you see this every day? How do 
the people all over the world and all the suffering. And of course, I started thinking about the sex traffickers and all these children and all these, and this compassion about, oh God, how do you deal with it? Well, um, you know, it, it, I was like, this is so much suffering. And I remember being on an airplane, looking down at all the houses one time, and I thought, you know, Jesus is right there in this house, and he knows in this house this woman is suffering from, um, you know, violence, physical violence from somebody that says he loves her. And I was seeing over this house where this child, their parents were doing drugs and there's no food. They're, they're not, you know, they're being abused. And then the sexual, and I was like, how, I've always had this, how do you do this, Lord? And the thing was is that uh, as, I, as I began to see this, I saw this thing on my phone and it, it talked about an honor walk and what that is, which I felt like to just play it. And it was a video in the hospital of a little girl that was dead and they were taking her down the hall to the operating room to harvest her organs with their mom and dad and family following, all the nurses and doctors had come out to honor her. And I, I just broke and I began to weep. And I was like, Lord, the last act of this child was to give life. And yet that very life that the, the parents' <laughs> daughters were giving life to somebody, they were dying. And in my years of what I call the wanderings in my life, I had three, I had two girl, very close girlfriends. And I was at Rama, and one day I got a phone call from one of them. And, she, and you know, she, when I got born again and filled with the spirit, her, her response to that was, this is gonna last about two weeks with you. Wow. Mm. You know, this is going to last two weeks and you'll be over this stuff. Here I stand, right? Amen. right? Amen. Here I stand. So, mm -hmm. but she called, they call the ones that know Jesus, don't they? Mm -hmm. And she said, Amber Jean, her daughter, a five-year-old, five -year had been riding a bike with her stepdad. And the little girl got scared and couldn't get the bike out of the way, and a guy flew around the corner and killed her. Mm. And she was on life support, and Gig called me, and we prayed. And so when I saw that honor thing, oh, I thought, dear Lord, what are you doing here? You know, it was so heavy. And then as I just totally lost it thinking again, back 30 some years ago about Amber Jean. I had, I had, um, where is it, right here. I had bought this little book, the Bible Promise book, and I bought several of them to put in my purse so when God would leave me, I'd have some to put in people's hands. Anyways, he, It was turned to this page, and I felt the leading to pick it up, and this is what it said. This was on July 13, 2021. And this is what it says, Isaiah 63, 9. In all their sufferings, he also suffered, and he personally, personally rescued them in his love and his mercy he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them through all the years. Now, I have, you know, 
I've been to Bible school. I've read the Bible before, right? I've read Isaiah, I don't know how many times. But this is why you have to read your word every day. It's a living word. Amen. And on this day, God was showing me something about my personal suffering. Child abuse, divorce, miscarriage. We have lots of areas of suffering. You know, being a caretaker day in and day out, you're laying your life down. No greater love has a man than to lay his life down for someone else, right? Right, you know, some people are going through divorces and it breaks them and you know, it's suffering. And you know, when I was a young single parent with two kids, money was always the height of my anxiety, you know, it was so, it was just always struggle with money financially. And I just read where the executive of Bed Bath & Beyond went to the top of his building's penthouse and jumped off. Wow. And killed himself. You know, it's funny what they wrote about this man. He had everything to live for. He had $6.5 billion. He had everything to live for, money to live for. The money wasn't, didn't help me. He needed to know the Prince of Peace, yes. Yes. Right? right? We got to change this perspective because we're missing it. Yeah. We're missing it. He did, if he had everything to live for, if he would have had the Prince of Peace. So, it doesn't say about this verse, it doesn't say he knew about your sufferings. See, Jesus was in that room when my uncle was molesting me, right? He, he heard me when I was crying as a little six-year-old, right? He saw everything, but that's not what the scripture says. It says in all their sufferings, he also suffered. It wasn't that he was there. It wasn't that he saw it. It wasn't that he heard it. He suffered because I was suffering. And it says he personally rescued them. You know, it's one thing for somebody to send somebody else to help somebody, right? When I was in Florida, uh, and I was trying to get a hold of Doug, and Doug has always been, if Tammy calls, whether he was delivering a baby, and he saw that he would say, who's on that phone? Well, it's Tammy. He said, you call her back and you tell her, as soon as I deliver this baby, I'll call her. Or if he was in, it didn't matter. Doug has always been like that. My husband's a doctor and he's busy, but he always has been there for me. So, so it, I know when I call my husband, <coughs> it might be 10 minutes or 15 or whatever, but I know I'm gonna get a phone call. So I was in Florida and I was calling him and calling him and calling him and he wasn't answering. I called and called and he still wasn't answering. That is just out of character. And so that just goes, what, 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 what's going on? Now the other thing you don't know, that when I was in Florida, Doug called me to tell me that my son had died. Okay, so now, what, what's in, I'm 2,000 miles away from my husband and where is he and what's going on, yeah. right? And, and that, you know where that fear came. The last time, yeah, it was bad. So I was trying to keep my peace about that. So I called my son, I'm 2,000 miles away. I'm already halfway, you know, should I, do I book a flight and go home? Because of what happened last time. So I, um, I called my son 
and this, this is on the blood. And I said, your dad's not answering my phone calls. And I said, something's wrong. And I want you to go to the farm and I want you to check on him. And he said, yeah, that's really weird. You wouldn't answer your phone calls. And so I'm waiting, waiting. So three hours later, Doug calls me. He's fine, he's fine. He lost his phone out in the pasture somewhere. He couldn't, he had been on a tractor. He, he was looking and looking, couldn't find the phone. That's all, that's all good. But what I found out later, my son did not go out and check on him. My son did what's called a police check. Okay, send somebody else. We're thanking God today that I was 2,000 miles away, right? That's my husband. You don't send the police. God bless the police. Thank you, Jesus, for the police. This, this is priority. You go. You get it? The other part of this verse says he personally rescued. He did not send another. Yes. This was priority. This was for Tammy. I'm coming for you, babe. If nobody else, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you and you and you, right? right. It's personal. He wanted the job done right. So, and then I love this part. He lifted them up and carried them through all the years. I'm telling you, because of the things of my childhood, it took me places and I was involved in stuff that severe, chronic depression, suicidal all my t teenage years, okay? Chronic sleep problems. You, you can't have somebody coming in when you're a little girl, sleepy, and wondering when's the next time. So, so I had chronic sleep. And these, um, these memories about this sexual abuse were repressed. I did not know where these things came from until I was almost 30 years old and I had some flashbacks and that stuff was revealed. And I didn't understand now why this was hidden and now you're gonna make me carry around this fire. What do you do with all that stuff? And I was just furious with the, the Lord. Why? I would have been better off if I had not known. But, but you know what my loving father said? It's an infection, Tammy, and it's festering. I'd already been through two marriages. He said, I'm not going to let this continue because I have someone for you, and it needs to be dealt with. And it needs to be dealt with at the right time. Right, because when he revealed it, I had been filled with the Holy Ghost. Right? I know that's part of the reason for waiting. I needed the Holy Ghost. And I needed that word. If you're suffering, you need to take that IV drip pole and connect your Bible because I didn't just occasionally read my Bible or every day read my Bible. When this was all revealed to me, I was in that word every 15 minutes sometimes. Just, you know, it's the surgery, it's the cleansing and the scrubbing and it's the taking out and the rooting up and the plucking down. And anyways, God is good and he is faithful. So, you know, he carried me through all those years. I, I'm sure I would not 
I had planned and plotted out a suicide at one point. But it would not be because God carried me through those dark years. Now, Philippians 3.10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings becoming conformed unto his death. I have read this scripture many times and I would land on it and I'd always have this sense, I just don't get that. I don't get how I would, because of our religious slant, I could not get how I would know him in, in you know, in his, the power of his resurrection and his death, right? How would I know that? I'm not going to hang on a cross or I... I I've not been resurrected like that. So I could never get that verse. But then one day, right, it became life to me. And it says again, that I may know him and in the power of resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming conformed unto his death. In the Greek, the word uh, resurrection it simply means rising up. I always felt like I was laying on the ground with somebody's boot on my neck and not ever being able to get up, right? So I was knowing him in the power of my resurrection, up the rising up out of the darkness, the miry clay, sitting my feet on a firm foundation, the rock of Jesus, right? Yes. That's how I know him. Not, not his sufferings, yes. the fellowship of our sufferings. So then the Greek word for fellowship means holding something in common. It was my sufferings and his sufferings coming together. That's, that's how we intimately know him through the things we've suffered together. And that's why my heart goes out to women. Because, you know, suffering comes in different stages and different times. I talked to a lady last night, you know. When I went through my divorces, they were horrendous and children got hurt in the middle of two immature people battling for control. And, you know, the thing is, is that we have something in common. And, you know, we are to be there for the fellowship of holding other people, right? When you're hurt, I might not be suffering. I am to bear one another's burden. Mm -hmm. And I need to be there for you when you're hurting. And I know there'll be somebody there. I, I, you know, suffering can be past, present, and future. Now, I'm gonna tell you something. When my son died, it was about two weeks after he died, um, who said something about the gut, a gut punch? I think it was, uh, okay, um, anyways. Anyway, somebody talked about a gut punch. When my son died, I walked around in a daze. It's like getting somebody kicking you in the gut, and, and it is so shocking, right? It's terribly shocking. So in this particular day, it was about two weeks after he died, and I just needed comfort. And so I went to my husband and I said, Doug, I just need, I need comfort. I mean, I need, and he put his arm around me and he said to me something so strange. He looked at me and he said, Tammy, he said, we're going to face other tragedies. 
we're going to have other trauma. And I, and I felt like a rooster who was plucked up, you know, fluffed up for a fight because I was like, in what way or shape is that comforting? Yeah. Tell me in the future we're going to go through more tragedy, more trauma. Listen, I thought to myself, I never, I never voiced these thoughts, but I thought to myself, I just buried my dad. I just buried, this was all within three weeks. I just buried my dad. I just buried my son. I just buried my uncle. I just saw my cousin lose her dad and she was devastated. I thought, thank you very much. My suffering tank is full, mm -hmm. right? It's full. And I never, I remember right where I was when he said that. And I remembered walking a little bit into this room and thinking, I don't even know what to do with that. We're gonna suffer in the future. We're gonna have trauma. We're gonna have more tragedy. I didn't even know what to do with that. But you know what? Doug was absolutely right. We are all gonna suffer further, right? As long as we're in this world, we will have tribulation. But just understanding what Jesus did about this resurrection and the, uh, the, other, the other word in there was conform. And it talks about conforming to another pattern. And that is we die daily. Right? We die daily. We put the flesh under daily. We, you know, we know that there's more suffering, but we have to keep it in perspective. Because this this is a message for the, the church, and the, the church needs to hear it. There's suffering coming. And, and instead of being how I was in the beginning, where no, 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 no more suffering. Had a lifetime of it, no more suffering. Because God gave me this word, because God gave me this word, you know, he says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. Just for the understanding what those two scriptures mean to me, I, I don't foresee myself resisting suffering. I don't, I don't have that, uh-uh, had enough. You know, Lord, I'm not afraid of the suffering. I won't fear it because the real bondage is trying to avoid it. Right? The real bondage is trying to avoid suffering. You know, when Doug made that statement, Kobe died in um, two, 2013. I don't know how many years that is. But I, I, I always felt like his statement that day was unfinished business. And I marvel at how God would use that to deal with me. All these years later, it makes sense. That's, that's what I needed to hear at that moment. Even though I couldn't receive it then, I readily accept it, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to learn to embrace suffering because it is in the pain that purpose Okay, every bit of my pain, there's, I, I don't say this in an arrogant way, but in an honest way. I don't think there's many women God could bring across my path that I couldn't minister to. Okay, and there, <laughs> I haven't even scratched the surface on what other things were in my life, but there's not many women he couldn't bring me that I couldn't move in compassion and empathy, right? And give them wisdom. So 
2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, it says, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. The comfort us to comfort us in all our troubles or sufferings so that we can comfort others. That's the plan. Yeah. It is not about me. It's about you. It's about the women he'll bring. It's about ministering comfort from the place of pain. That's the purpose. Um, and we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. We need to comfort one another always. So I have this song and if you have not seen the words or heard the song, go on YouTube because it's a prayer and it's also a declaration. So we're gonna sing, um, Sophia's gonna sing it for us. And I just want you to meditate what these words say. <clears throat> 